On the coastline of the ocean of the dead, of all history, and the tiny little island of the living in the present day, we see a lifeless body. She is perfectly still, and she might as well be sleeping. We know the difference between sleep and death, and know that death is forever, but this foreverness, this time, is itself invisible. The stillness of the body is evidence of death, but this is not, it is not death itself, just as movement is not always evidence of life, and is certainly not life itself. I will continue on your yeah. communication device. <laughs> That's the second one, yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The moment of death is like a separation of a mold from a form, which had passed onto it all the particularities of its configuration. When the mold is destroyed by the act of separation, the flesh perishes. But the form, the self that was cast, is non-material, hence is immortal, an, in, an identity invisible but real, publicly acknowledged and known by a name. This self is, according to another witch, Maya Deren, the spirit that continues to exist invisibly in the material world without the need for a body. This spirit is the immortal twin of the mortal man. And I will take now your communication device. I'm not, I'm on this You're on Arts Land, <laughs> Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to skip last time. <laughs> and I will go on this next. Can we read an article about this? <laughs> I will go on in the ritual indoctrination. After death, the descent of the spirit changes with the passing of time into the narratives of her contemporaries. Gradually, the immediate first hand memories, the flesh of the original human personality, withers away so that only the distilled, depersonalized, almost abstract essence of the principle that especially characterized her solidifies. Thus, the person becomes an essence, and later on, a principle over time. What was once believed is now believed in. So where are you, darling? I didn't use the internet, so now I have to create an account for you. <laughs> <laughs> How are we here? Ah, yeah, yeah, that looks good, no? You have to move around. I have to move around. No, that's a difficult machine. I don't know if I can use that. I'll try it. No, I think it's too... I think there's a trick, but... Yeah. See, even smartphone owners sometimes don't know how to use that. <laughs> okay, I will go on with this one. It is one of the constitutive ideals of Western societies that humans are free in the formation of their spirits and that we as individual spirits inhabit our bodies. But in a society in which people are interdependent and produced together, the freedom of the individual spirit is only alive in a collective behavior. I'll stay on that. <laughs> <laughs> However, the community in which we live and which until now suffers from the tragically failed world healing, stages freedom as an omnipolitical principle and brandishes the holy grail of free and individual development as a fetish. Freedom appears as an always unreachable false god, as individual failure. For freedom is the mere tradition of a lifeless system of rules in this society. It is dead and solidified as an abstract principle, yet it has never inhabited a human body. The white clay. <laughs> so maybe I take this white clay as, an, as a little uh, small break in the individualistic indoctrination and ask here Oli to give me my ritualistic bag, which is over there. It's the pink bag. Thank you. Because while the while the ritualistic indoctrination is um, going on, I have brought you some objects that might um, actually um, profit from um, the what is said here. First of all, I have some yoga mats for the ones I've already. Um, Okay. 
That's for everybody, even the ones who don't know their smartphones. So when I come by and want to read more, I have to take off the yoga mat again. So everyone has a yoga mat? We have some objects for now, and then I will start, like, I start one by one. We have, you have to hold it really hard just so the, the objects can stay there. Have another spirit. Okay. So I'll stay here with one more. Nothing to do with you first. <laughs> so we are at uh, chapter 7, the 7th chapter of the ritualistic imagination. The only connected behavior that this system of rules admits is labor. Its economic value, the societal embodiment of its products as goods, the general form of money, and its intermediation through markets. All these categories were formed by blind historic processes on one hand, but were self-applied by humans in a process of habituation and internalization on the other hand. So they appear today as insurmountable anthropological constants and as principles which seem to be beyond reproach, just like a pre-modern divinity. We skip that one that doesn't have a yoga mat, so you get a yoga mat and an <laughs> The principles and categories of the capitalist relations of production have formed the whole nature of the planet, the people that live on it, the goods they produce, the ideas and wishes, spirits and dreams into a common surface, a second nature. The principles and categories in which this second nature functions have gained the status of laws of nature. They seem to be more natural than, for example, protectorama, while they are actually more absurd than a witch in a world healing forest could ever be. I'll stay here with more two, or where are we here? No, see? <laughs> Maybe there's a disadvantage <laughs> to these um, yoga mats on top. These principles of value, goods, money, and markets are themselves abstractions. They are real but invisible as well. Abstraction is what differentiates them from the old sovereigns of the churches and the courts. It is their nature not to be embodied into one person, not to be gathered under one banner, not to be expressed in one case or class, but to enter the entirety of things and beings of the material world, similar to the Japanese spirit. I will go on to this one. You <laughs> <clears throat> the laws of the second nature produce an endless abundance of objects and accumulate a surreal <coughs> amount of wealth. The tragically comic absurdity lies in the fact that even those who have available wealth cannot consume it joyfully, but are forced to reinvest it back into circulation. They are forced, at the threat of their own downfall, to expand and to enlarge, to progress and to spread out. Capital, the magic whose rules demand wealth, whose rules then devour it and repeat the process again, appears as a self-propelling ghost rider, a perpetual motion machine, perpetually giving birth to itself without any material friction, like an egg that lies itself. What do you say, lays itself? Lays, lays. Okay. <laughs> um, so you get yoga mat and the egg. <laughs> how, how are we here? Fuck the police. Save <laughs> 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 the nature. Save the nature. Egg. <laughs> Humanity, therefore, has transmuted into a mere accessory of an economy that has taken on a life of its own. Our social activity confronts us like a foreign and external power. Our sociability has slipped into the dead products and its monetary forms, while we ourselves encounter each other in the form of anonymous competition. To the Geisterbeschwörer Marx, this completely insane 
and objectified domination by an economy that took on a life of its own resembles an ancient fetish, like the ones in pre-modern societies. A fetish divinity is money that begets money. The self-laying egg is made from gold or chocolate. <laughs> This. <laughs> it doesn't work. Let me see. Where are you? Network info com. <laughs> Domains with an app. All right. <laughs> Let's go on to the ghost. Let's see. All right. Freedom is fetish, work, goods, money, second nature. Da, da, da. Egg. Money. That's the wish we are. 128 years ago, a man with the name Karl Marx ceased to exist. His material body decomposes in a pastoral garden in London, but his spirit is still haunting the world. Marx himself, as a human being, was a colleague of the witch Protectorama, for he was a Geisterbeschwörer too. His critique gave a body to the invisible principles underlying the economy, a body in their time. But this body has also decayed. <laughs> Marx was not only an incarnator of ghostly principles, he was also a world healer. His statement, it wasn't only about describing the world, but rather about changing it, represents this commitment. His establishment of the workers' movement as the revolutionary subject which could exercise the fetish divinity was an objectivation in its own time, a temporary embodiment which now has to be revised and will always have to be as long as capitalism. Because the body of this historic movement has deco decomposed as well. So I'm changing one more time my smartphone. No. Let's see what's behind this object. It has been healed. It has been healed. Ah, oh, it has been healed. That's very nice. One effect of the world healing. All right. So we are at the last chapter of the uh, ritualistic indoctrination. It, it hasn't been here. Um, you unhealed it. Um, I'm un <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So, it's about putrefaction. If the ghostly spirits that are objectified in things are not living spirits, do not reflect a conscious and collective behavior, but instead a dead and petrified system of rules. How can we exercise these spirits? And I mean, don't mean exercise, but exorcise these spirits from all the things and people. And how can the witches, all the witches, heal all the things and people's possessions with these spirits? So Protectorama wouldn't be a witch. And generally certainly not a world healing witch if she didn't have answers to questions that other people deem unanswerable. And for this, to answer this question, she's making use of her uh, exercise in voodoo ritualistic practice. As 